Hello and welcome to another installment of Gutter Fighting Secrets. Today what we're going to be taking a look at is the history of Muay Thai. Now honestly, there's a lot of documentaries out there on YouTube for free, which are really good about Muay Thai. But what I kind of wanted to do here is tie it into what we always talk about, which is close combat, street fighting, reality-based self-defense. Now Muay Thai is the national sport of Thailand. And they would actually consider it the national science of Thailand as well. It's also referred to as the science of the eight limbs, or utilizing your body's eight limbs as weapons. Some people might not think so, but fighting is definitely a science. And the way that the Thais tend to break it down is definitely scientific. Now, when I first started Muay Thai about two years ago, I kind of slept on it. And I, I was thinking to myself, you know, this is a sport. This is kickboxing. How fucking hard could it be? I've been doing close quarters combat for about ten years. But I quickly found out the hard way that that's actually not the case. Muay Thai is extremely deadly and can be extremely efficient. Obviously, when you're fighting in the ring, there's a lot of rules. But before there was rules and before there was Muay Thai as an organized sport, most people don't know, but there were like four or five different arts that Muay Thai stemmed from. And originally, it was a close quarters or a close combat fighting system designed to kill your opponent quickly. Now, today... All of these arts are kind of collectively known under an umbrella term, and that term is Muay Baran. Now, I don't speak any Thai, but my research would tell me that Muay Baran simply means like ancient boxing or ancient striking. Now, if we dive a little deeper into this, we'll see that Siam, which apparently Thailand used to be Siam, and when it was Siam, it had three different distinct hand-to-hand -hand fighting systems in like different parts of the country. So in the north, it had Muay Jung. Moi Karat in the northeast, and Moi Chaya in the south. Now, in addition to all of these unarmed fighting systems, there was also a system of fighting with swords called Krabby Krabong. And I apologize because I definitely butchered the hell out of that. But like I said, I speak zero Thai, so we're going to have to go with it. Now, there definitely were other systems out there. Those are kind of some of the known systems today. The thing is, Thailand, or Siam, had always been at war with its neighbors and always been fighting them off in order for survival, which is why they had all of these systems of hand-to-hand -hand and armed combat. Now, Vietnam, Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Malaysia, they had always been trying to invade Thailand, take it over, kill them all, enslave them, whatever. So obviously the Thais got very good at fighting and systems of, systems of combatives. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the history about these ancient systems and whatnot has all been destroyed. Because during the Burmese Wars, uh, the capital of Thailand was sacked and burnt to the ground pretty much. So unfortunately, whatever we could have known is destroyed. Whatever is left, Thailand has it. They probably keep it under lock and key or whatever. But apparently, a lot of this history and stuff kind of is up for debate among scholars. So I'm just trying to go with whatever I can find. Some of you guys out there might know a lot more about this than me. Feel free to leave comments and whatever. Let me know what I got wrong, what I got right. But as I was saying, what we do know about Muay Thai it was originally referred to kind of as the science of eight limbs. And the limbs on the human body would mimic the weapons of war. So the hands were the sword, the dagger, the shins and forearms became shields for blocking. A lot of people know Muay Thai is kind of notorious. These fighters are really good at using their shins and whatnot to block kicks, which is fucking hardcore. Because those guys kick hard and it really hurts to use your shin to block even a light kick, let alone the way those motherfuckers kick. And speaking about kicks, their kicks and their knees would mimic the staff and the axe, and the elbows would mimic like a mace or a hammer crashing and falling down upon their opponent. So they'd use these weapons to work their way in. Obviously, we know about Thai clenching and whatnot. They'd clench up, they'd grapple, and I think everyone who's studied Muay Thai knows how brutally effective their clenching, grappling, trapping skills are. So that was the whole idea. You strike your way in, you clench up, you spin your opponent to the ground, and you kill him. <laughs> it's really a very highly effective system, and I can imagine back in the day it was even more effective than it is today, at least as far as a system of close combatives. And this is probably why a lot of Special Forces guys I've met around the world have all just loved Muay Thai. Because in its essence, it's all about just fucking destroy your enemy. 
So anyway, moving on. Now, I mentioned that the Thais and the Burmese had been at war for a long time, and subsequently the Burmese sacked Thailand's capital and burnt it to the ground, thusly destroying a lot of their records. But there is a story that does survive and live on in infamy as far as Thai boxing goes. So, the Burmese went to war and captured Thailand, taking lots of valuables and lots of prisoners back with them to Miramar. Now, one of these prisoners was a fellow by the name of Nai Knum Tum. Now, Mr. Knum Tum was an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combatants, and it just so happened that at that time, the king of Miramar was hosting a martial arts tournament with some records, say 10, some records, say 12, of his best fighters. And this king wanted to put the Thai fighters up against his fighters. So, Mr. Knum Tum decided that he would go ahead and fight these 10 or 12 fighters on the condition that if he beat them all, he would be set free. The king apparently agreed, and the tournament proceeded. But, as the tournament was getting ready to begin, Nai Knum Tum began performing the Y Crew, which roughly translates into English from what I understand as respect for teachers or respecting teacher. And for those of you guys who don't really know what this is because we don't really do it in America, it's basically like kind of a dance before the fight begins. They have kind of a choreographed ceremony that they do. And for anyone who isn't familiar with it, I'd highly recommend that you kind of look it up and see it because it's, it's pretty cool actually. And they still do it in Thailand before all the fights. So he was performing the Y Crew and these Miramar fighters, the Burmese fighters, have never seen it before. And they were like, what the hell is he doing? And they thought that he was performing superstitions on them. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't, I don't know. But... In any case, this freaked these fighters out because people over there really believe in that stuff. And I'm sure back in the day they believed in it even more. So they were so jittered and freaked out about this superstition thing that they thought he was putting on them that it totally threw them off their game and he subsequently knocked them all out. So as the story goes, the king kept his word and released Mr. Tom and even gave him a couple wives and sent him on his way. So this story really is very important, actually, when you really study the history and the culture of Thailand, and as well as the history and the culture of Muay Thai. They still actually even have it, like, in beer commercials and stuff over there. You can see on TV that it's really a respected and well-known story. It definitely shows that he brought the respect back for the Thai people and the Thai warriors after they were captured. So, moving on more to kind of modern times here, and I am skipping over a lot of the history, but this is not intended to be an in-depth history. I just kind of wanted to go over the basics and just kind of give some honor to the art that's taught me so much over the past couple of years. So, during World War II, Muay Thai started kind of absorbing its first Western influences. A lot of soldiers were apparently stationed over there after it was liberated from the Japanese. And they saw these Thai boxing matches and Thai boxing and they were really impressed by it. A lot of them approached some of the Thai fighters and said, hey, listen, teach me the basics of this stuff. I really want to know more about it. It's definitely not like the Western boxing and wrestling that they would have been learning back then in the Army. And I'm sure if I was a soldier stationed over there back then and I saw this stuff, I would have been like, yeah, I am down. Teach me everything I can learn. It really had to be very impressive as a GI back then to look at these fighting tactics from the Orient and, you know, think, wow, like, this is some cool stuff. So, the French were really impressed by it. They apparently named it Le Sport de Orient, or like the Sport of the Orient. The Americans and Brits were also very impressed by it. A lot of these guys started practicing it kind of amongst themselves. So, before Western culture really started to influence the Thai people and Thai boxing, Thai boxers didn't put their hands in gloves. They wrapped them in hemp rope. And... It wasn't fought in a ring, it was fought like in out, outside courtyards or sand pits or something like that. And I'm really not sure if it was before or after or during the war. I've read conflicting reports, but eventually, you know, they kind of started to adopt the Western boxing type of thing and they put gloves on, they started fighting in the ring. There were more rules put into it, weight classes began to be added. So it really started to kind of resemble um, the institution of West, Western boxing more and more. Before all that, it was kind of just an anything-goes type of match. Uh, I mean, it still, compared to Western boxing, has a lot less rules. But today, there are a lot more rules than there would have been you know, back in the old times. But with that in mind, when you go see fights in Thailand, there still are a lot less rules than Muay Thai fights in the States and I believe in Europe as well. But, you know, we're notorious over here for making everything fucking full of red tape, so it is what it is. But 
over in Thailand, dude, it's it's way different. Now, apparently, these guys start training over there at like six or eight. Um, I know my teacher, my Muay Thai teacher, he said he started fighting at, I think, eight years old, maybe 10. And his first fight, he knocked the other kid out with a knee and was paid the equivalent of like six American dollars, which, if my math is right, would be, I don't know, 200 Thai baht. These fighters over there will fight about every month, uh, three weeks maybe, and get paid, I don't know, about four to 6,000 uh, Thai baht, which in the US currency would equal about anywhere between 120 to like 180, 90 US dollars. And as far as I know, they'll, they'll kind of live on that in between fights. It's not much, but life over in Thailand is definitely way different than here in the States. And these guys will train insane. Uh, my teacher was telling me he'd run like four miles in the morning, go do his thing, and then at night he'd like spar and run some more and train for another four to six hours, some crazy shit like that. They are extremely good and they are extremely fierce fighters. And this is what these guys do. The professionals who fight in Muay Thai, usually their fathers were Muay Thai fighters or something like that, and they'll just freaking train Muay Thai, and that's like all they do. So I realize this has been an extremely comprehensive or in-depth study here, but I just wanted to do kind of a brief summary history of the art of Muay Thai, because I really enjoy it, and a lot of other people really enjoy it as well. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, please, you know, let me know. Post them down there in the comments. If there's any other videos you'd like me to make or any topics you'd like discussed, feel free to let me know as well. Go ahead and follow me on Instagram at Gutter Fighting Secrets. I tend to kind of put more of my hands-on self-defense type stuff on Instagram and more of my longer videos on here. So with all that in mind, thank you for your time. Please go ahead and like this, subscribe, share, all that jazz. And remember that you are your first and last line of defense. Thanks.